Asher. I represent the appellant who is the plaintiff in this action, uh, Asmahan Jaber, who uh, goes by the name of Sue. Um, Sue worked for many, many years for defendant First Merit Bank and had no problem during all those times that she worked for First Merit. She was promoted, she continued to do well. Her most signal um, attribute was that, as I think all employers would like, is that her customers loved her. She especially was um, looked for by customers who would come into her branch, whatever branch she was assigned to. Some customers, in fact, would not continue with their business if Sue was not there. They would say, you know, I'll come back on another day when Sue is on, on duty. And all of that went very well until the summer of approximately uh, 2011, I believe, when Sue had um, a personal medical condition where she asked to have some time off. And she wasn't given the time off, which upset her. And she tried to find out through human resources at the bank and through her employer why she couldn't get some time off. And in the course of the back and forth of that, Sue eventually let it slip that she had done all of these things for the bank, including working off the clock. Now the working off the clock point wasn't just Sue Jaber working off the clock. There was a pattern in practice at First Merit of the people in the branch working off the clock in the evening, usually, to make calls to customers that had that so many had to be made every month as part of their marketing program. And Sue was the because Sue brought this to the attention of human resources outside the branch it became an issue. Only Sue was followed up with about this problem. Although there is evidence in the file that, uh, aside from Sue's own testimony, that shows that other people were asked to work off the clock without compensation. As a result of that, Sue was written up as a, as a sort of last chance agreement. Also during this time, Sue began to get more and more difficulty in being able to deal with her supervisors. She would, was belittled, given some difficulty if she wanted to go to leave to go to the bathroom. She was called out across the bank in front of customers. She was literally called out on every single thing that she did that the bank didn't like. Whereas others who did various mistakes were not called out and treated in the same way. Sue is the only one of that group at that time that was an age of the age that she was at, she's Lebanese, speaks with a slight accent, which makes her a little more visible. Um, and of course, she is a woman. When she was ultimately fired, she was replaced with a younger woman who was not Lebanese. She was given more and more work to do as the branch cut back in personnel. She begged to have some help to do the work. Got no help, was told that the problem is yours because you're disorganized. This is why you can't get it done. Uh, one of the uh, defendants named in the case, Ms. Uh, Terry, 
would stand in her office door and watch her work. She was under scrutiny. Uh, there were times when things would go wrong at the bank, Sue would be blamed for them, whether Sue was responsible or not. Counsel, were there other individuals who were similarly situated who also requested assistance with work? Not to my knowledge because they didn't need to. Um, Sue was told she didn't get everything into file boxes that could be locked up. She had so much material to deal with, it wouldn't have all fit. The affiant that is in the um, file spoke to that and spoke to how much Sue was put upon as compared to anybody else in terms of the amount of work that could possibly be done. And there is case law, and I cited it, where it is possible for a, um, an inappropriate for an employer to set an employee up to fail by giving the employee so much to do beyond the employee's ability to do it that the employee is not going to be able to, to possibly pass the employer's standard. That's one thing when you have a probationary employee just starting out and doesn't know much about how to get things done. Here we have a 30-some year employee who had been doing fine up until this sudden demarcation in her conduct. And none of that was looked into by the bank. Well, the employer did indicate that she had had um, on her evaluations certain uh, areas that she was um, basically written up on or said she needed improvement. So some of those areas were the same as what ultimately led supposedly to her discharge. Well, uh, the main part of those areas had to do with a, a client who then came in and testified that those areas were not true. His In the evaluations? Pardon me? The evaluations? Right. He testified that what Sue was accused of having done wrong on his account was not anything that Sue did. That he didn't have any problem with Sue. The problem with his account occurred from something someone else in the bank did or didn't do. I'm sorry, I maybe I'm just remembering incorrectly, but I thought that was pertaining to the ultimate discharge, the allegations against her with the ultimate discharge, not what was in the evaluations. The allegation and the ultimate discharge were just vaguely stated that she didn't do some of the things that she was supposed to do. They weren't very clearly listed. They hung their hat on the um, overtime. The committee that reviewed whether she should be terminated knew that she was concerned about discrimination. And no one looked into discrimination. The thing that is the most concerning about this is that no other person who was working overtime off the clock prior to Sue first being written up was ever examined about it. She was singled out because she complained. And so they made a point of paying her, trying to get her to come up with a number that they could pay her with for the overtime, and they put her on a last chance agreement. And yet other people in that bank had been working off the clock all along as well. And none of that was examined, questioned, that the affiant that's in the file said no one had testified that no one asked her if she'd ever worked overtime, as an example. Did I reserve three minutes? I know you did. I'm going to let you know it's five. You're right at five now. Okay. Um, So, Sue 
Jaber is one of those people that the laws were written to cover. She has an opportunity, should have the opportunity to allow her evidence to be reviewed by a jury to determine whether there was discrimination going on in the way she was treated and in the way her termination was papered and organized to get her out of the bank. Because in, under the circumstances of everything else that was going on. And that's why we're here today. She was, uh, I mentioned in the briefs about bullying. The bullying aspect is, is very solid. I realize there's no tort of bullying in the state of Ohio, but it, it's part and parcel with discrimination issues. And I ask this court to consider that aspect of the onerous work environment that this woman was put under so that there was no other option but for her to at some point fail and be terminated. And I'd like to, to reserve three to come back after the Thank you. Thank you. My name is Tom Crooks. I'm here on behalf of First Merit Bank, Shirley Urich, Jennifer O'Brien, and Mary Perry. And we urge this court to affirm Judge McKinney's order granting summary judgment. Summary judgment is and was proper and appropriate in this case because there are no genuine issues of material fact in dispute and the appellees are entitled to judgment as a matter of law. The material facts in this case aren't in dispute because they are admitted. Uh, Ms. Jaber admitted that she worked off the clock. She admitted that she was instructed multiple times not to work off the clock, but she disregarded that instruction and continued to work off the clock. She's admitted to customer service deficiencies. First Merit attempted to correct this conduct through performance reviews, through corrective action, through probation, but Ms. Jaber did not conform. This is not a conspiracy to get rid of Ms. Jaber because of her national origin or her age or her health issues as she alleges the discharge is because she continued to engage in unacceptable conduct after she was duly warned. And again, these are things that she admitted to. Counsel, how do you explain a termination without any I've had throughout this case, and it's hard to explain, um, but I know that um, the customer complaints, if you will, well, are real, you know, for forgetting to do things and uh, um, not paying attention to customers, and yeah, there were customers that um, loved her, and, and we're not disputing that at all, but we know that we had customer service deficiencies. And the other issue is that um, the instruction for her not to work off the clock is clear. And First Merit has legal obligations under the federal and state uh, wage and hour laws to compensate employees when they are working or when they, um, when they work. So, counsel, let me stop you there. Sure. Sure that they were not in violation of their labor standards act. Right. 
Um, in October, the record says in October of 2011, the branch was advised that no one should work off the clock. That if you're working, you need to clock in. In 2011. That was 2011. And was this before or after you learned of uh, individuals, including the plaintiff, working off the clock? This would be after. It was um, September 20 when she wrote her rebuttal to the um, corrective action with respect to the customer service issues, where she said that she was working off the clock and she um, had been doing so for a long time. That's when HR got involved, investigated, and, and act, act, actually um, asked her how many hours that she was working. Sure, because I needed but I'm really more interested in everybody else. All right, so, so um, and what's in the record, obviously? Right in the record um, that um, Christine Hurston, who um, um, signed an affidavit in this case, says that in the fall of 2011. HR came to the branch and told everyone that they shouldn't work off the clock. And um, in, in addition, the uh, last chance warning also says that in but, but again, that goes to Mrs. Jaber. Goes to Mrs. Jaber, you're right. Um, so, so I'm looking at, in other words, maybe I can direct your attention I'm more sorry. directly to something. No, no, it's okay. I'm just trying to figure it out. So they went to the branch and they told everybody they can't be working off knowing that they could be in violation of the Fair Labor Standards Act and could face potential penalties, right. which obviously is a very big concern of any employer. Right. So they already knew at least one employee was working off the clock, and you end up um, paying her $5,000. Correct. She indicated, according to, and we have to presume the facts in the light most favorable to the non-moving party, she indicates in her affidavit or her deposition testimony that many others were working off the clock. So my point is, did the bank do anything to investigate who the other people may be who are working off the clock and attempt to uh, compensate them for overtime as well as have some last chance agreement with them? Right. And the answer to your question directly is no. And I can tell you the reason for that is that it wasn't until after the fact that Ms. Jaber says that there were other people, and at no time did, were, were any other employees identified, and First Merit had no knowledge of any other employees. And so... Um, but did First Merit, and I'm just asking what's in the record. Right. Did First Merit talk to the branch manager and ask if anybody, was there any records? Um, you know, obviously there's records kept of people coming in and out of the building and so forth. There's nothing in the record that, that uh, First Merit asked the, uh, the managers to Had there been, and, and again, this, is, this isn't in the record either, but had there been other people uh, that had been identified specifically, uh, my inclination is that, that uh, those uh, individuals would have, been, would have been questioned and the same actions would have been taken. It's a little bit of a misnomer to say that right, off, right out of the box, Ms. Um, Jaber was put on a last chance um, warning for uh, violation of the instruction not to work off the clock. She was instructed in September um, and in October that she shouldn't work off the clock, but then um, again, before the last chance um, warning was given, she'd already violated that. On November 14th, the week of November 14th and the week of November 21st, she came in and worked off the clock. That's what prompted the last chance warning. So she had the instruction, and in the record, she knew the instruction very clearly, um, and yet she continued to work off the clock. And so that prompted the last chance warning, which was November 30 of uh, 2011. The reason why I asked about that is because obviously one of the things she's arguing is that similarly situated people were not treated the same, that were not of protected classes. So I guess I'm trying to figure out right. what you as the bank, um, you know, put in your summary judgment motions, mm -hmm. your summary judgment motions with regard to that. 
question, and I guess my response is that there's nothing in the record that identifies a single individual by name that worked after the warning in October of 2011, worked off the clock, other than Ms. Jaber. In fact, if you look at the affidavit of Christine Hurston, she says that um, that uh, she, you know, she doesn't say that she continued to work off the clock, and there's been no one identified. And so, I guess from an evidentiary standpoint, I don't have um, a specific comparator. I have a statement that is maybe based on supposition or maybe on speculation that hey, look, there were other people that were doing this. Well, what, provide a context for mm -hmm. assuming this. Um, there were less than 10, okay, there were tellers, personal bankers, assistant manager, manager. Um, I'd like to speak to um, the issue that was raised in argument that she was set up to fail. And, um, and again, there's no evidence in the record that there were any other uh, personal bankers that were required. Um, you know, that she wasn't required to do anything else that any other personal banker was required to do. Um, there's no evidence that the tasks were impossible, or that she was that, that she was held to different standards, or that her um, uh, the volume was unmanageable. There's no evidence of any of that. In fact. With respect to setting up to fail, First Merit um, offered to move her to a different branch if she wanted to, and she refused. Also, evidence that the that she wasn't set up to fail is that upon her separation, Mary Terry took over many of her job duties in addition to her own uh, without any difficulty. Um, and I'd like to also speak to the case law that was cited, and that's the uh, South Forest case and the uh, uh, Densha versus uh, Farmers Insurance case, and, and the proposition that um, opposing counsel had presented is that by setting someone up to fail, um, that that is a sign of discrimination. Um, and what, that, what the cases really say is that if you assign someone an impossible task, a task that can't be performed, it's a sign of discrimination if you don't make a similar assignment to people outside the protected classification. And that's that's the distinction that we see in this case is that there's no proof, there's no evidence whatsoever that she was treated any differently than any other banker with respect to the, the duties and responsibilities. What's the record that show uh, regarding the bank's knowledge or awareness of um, this uh, perceived That's, that's an interesting um, issue and, and question because at summary judgment and in her deposition, she identified um, a heart attack that she had 13 years prior to um, separation as being um, the perceived disability. And um, the, um, in the Court of Appeals brief, she talks in terms of, of stress, which isn't in the record at all. Um, um, but First Merit didn't perceive her as being disabled. She said she wasn't disabled, and we know under the law that there's no requirement to accommodate a perceived, a perceived disability or regarded as disability. And so if she had, had actually had a disability and considered herself to, to be disabled, there would be um, an obligation. But here she says, look, I, I wasn't disabled, and that's in the record as well. So those, that's all record evidence. The other issue I'd like to touch on is that um, in, in the, arg the argument was that um, she created a genuine issue of material fact because um, the deficiencies, the um, customer service deficiencies, either weren't real or, or uh, were um, um, not communicated. But sim that's simply not the case, and that many 
in many places in the record and in her documents and in her own hand, um, she admits to um, deficiencies. She admits to poor customer follow-through uh, because she simply had forgotten or was too busy. Uh, she admitted to um, the fact that customers had criticized her for failing to um, um, uh, fill check orders or loan documents. Uh, customers criticized her for not securing overdraft protection. They failed, uh, uh, that she failed to place customers' orders because she um, accidentally left them in a file. Um, the, the, the record has um, many, many, many examples, um, both in her own hand and um, in the deposition where she admits to, to, to these things. And so the, the issue here is, um, and it's her burden to prove, that was the reason that First Mayor articulated, was that a pretext, and was the real reason discrimination? Well, it's her, it's her burden after you have met your burden. Of articulation, you're, you're right, you're correct, Your Honor. And, and I, I submit that First Mayor is clearly articulating the reason as being twofold. One, her failure to adhere to the specific instruction uh, to not work off the clock, and two, the customer service deficiencies. Um, those were the issues, those are the reasons that were articulated, and um, and those um, um, were in fact the reasons. Um, and Council, you are out of time. All right. Thank you very Thank much. You. We ask we ask the court to affirm. Thank you. Yeah, just a little over three minutes left. There is no question that Sue Jaber was busy. The problem with her busyness did not arise until she had an illness in the summer of 2011. And then a spotlight shone upon her that continued thereafter until she was terminated. What was the illness in 2011? What were the she was under some sort of stress. Her doctor suggested that she be home. And uh, <coughs> the bank did not give her the time off. Will the record indicate that she shared uh, this doctor's? Uh, With HR, right. yes. And in fact, that was what triggered her to write back and say, look, all the work I've done for this bank, including the overtime that I've worked without expecting any return for it, should I not be able to take the time off that I want to? So that started the downhill spiral of Ms. Japer at First Merit Bank. <laughs> the other employees were never looked at. Well, well did you identify names? You're, you're referring to overtime. Right, the, the affiant who is, his name escapes me at the moment, is one, and she says that all of them there, including the tellers, stayed. Now, the tellers are in a different classification. But that they stayed on a regular rotational basis as part of the routine at the branch. Off the clock to make these calls. And was this after the time that your client was No, this was before. So let's assume that they were doing this before mm -hmm. she contacted HR, but after she contacted HR and was told that she was not to do uh, any work online, is there going to be re record evidence that anyone else defied that, those instructions and anyone else in her classification worked online? I don't believe there is, but in, there is record evidence that she asked for permission to her to her bank manager, who then thereafter recanted and said he didn't give her permission. So there is a difference of opinion, or a difference of statement of fact there. Um, there are a lot of facts that swirl around this case that it's clear that she's different. She's a square peg in a round hole in this branch. 
She's very, very busy because of all of the people that she has that are her customers and prefer to be her customers. No one else was as busy in that respect as she was. She asked Ms. Ehrlich for help more than once and was told, organize yourself better. She was given no other counseling or indication of help. And that's the problem. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The court will take the matter under advisement. A written opinion will be prepared and sent to both sides, as well as you can look on our website or at the court in the Supreme